climate change has already had clear impacts on natural and human systems. Over the coming decades, based on various scenarios of emission of greenhouse gases, the range with which climate can change is quite wide and depends on policy decisions that we take now. The risk of negative impacts results from the interaction between the climate-related hazards and the vulnerability and exposure of both natural systems and human populations. The precise level of climate change that would trigger abrupt and irreversible change remains uncertain, but the higher the global temperature gets, the more risk there is. The main critical risks associated with climate change are flooding, either in coastal areas or inland, when changes in precipitation change the flow of rivers, the breakdown of infrastructure networks through extreme weather, mortality and morbidity during heat waves, food insecurities and the breakdown of food production chains, insufficient access to drinking water and water for irrigation, and the loss of marine, terrestrial and inland water ecosystems of their biodiversity and the benefits they provide. Subsequent major risks include a slowdown of economic growth that would further erode food security and make poverty reduction more difficult, the risk of violent conflicts, civil war and intergroup violence by amplifying conflict causes such as poverty and economic shocks and the subsequent risk of extensive population migrations. There are two approaches possible to face these risks. One is to prevent further climate changes from happening through mitigation measures and the other is through adaptation to the changes and their consequences should these happen. Regarding carbon emissions, for a business-as-usual scenario where greenhouse gas emissions continue to grow, their concentration could reach the equivalent of 750 to 1300 parts per million by 2100, compared to 400 parts per million now. Models predict, with the high confidence, that in this scenario the global surface temperature would increase by between 2.5 and 7.8 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. This scenario of continuing emissions poses a high risk of abrupt and irreversible regional-scale change in the composition, structure and function of many ecosystems. In the scenario where carbon emissions are reduced by 40 to 70 percent by 2050 and to essentially nothing by 2100, concentrations of greenhouse gases would reach no more than 450 parts per million by 2100, and global warming would be limited to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. This would prevent most of the catastrophic climate impacts that are anticipated. The people who are the poorest will also be the least able to adopt mitigation measures and to adapt to the subsequent socio-economic changes, and thus are the most vulnerable. How can we manage these critical risks? The capacity of any system, whether social, economic or environmental, to resist to major changes is known as its resilience. To maintain this resilience, we have to better manage the complexity of interactions between these systems, particularly between water, energy, land use, biodiversity systems and human populations and activities. However, the systemic or holistic approaches that are necessary to understand and manage these global interactions remain insufficiently applied. How the critical risks related to climate change will affect or overcome the capacity of resilience of these systems depend thus heavily on regulatory decisions that will be taken in the near future. If these are rapidly adopted and implemented, there will be less risks and a lower level of adaptation needed. The first step is to reduce the vulnerability and exposure of natural systems to present and future climate variability by reducing drastically carbon emissions. The key measures, according to the IPCC report, are first, a more efficient use of energy, and by the year 2050, a threefold or fourfold increase of the share of zero and low carbon energy sources, including renewable energy, nuclear energy, bioenergy, as well as afforestation and the development of means to capture and store CO2. Second, reducing CO2 emissions in all transport modes through technical improvements, behavioral changes, as well as new infrastructure and urban redevelopment investments, 
Electricity produced from low carbon sources has already a potential for electric rail and in medium term for road vehicles. Third, replacing cold fire power plants with modern, highly efficient natural gas power plants, provided that natural gas is available and that gas leaks are kept low during extraction and distribution. And fourth, an increased contribution of the liquid and gas biofuels which are already commercially available and of hydrogen fuels obtained from low carbon sources, but which are longer term options. And what are the possible mitigation measures? Besides standards and regulations, economic instruments can provide incentives for reaching these goals. These include public-private finance partnerships, loans, charges and subsidies. It also includes putting a financial value on the services such as clean water, the prevention of erosion and pollination that are provided by ecosystems, as well as including those financial values in the price of natural resources. However, it appears that many constraints can impede adaptation planning and implementation. These include the different perceptions of risk, the financial and human resources that are available, economic and business interests, the limitation of tools to monitor the effectiveness of implementation of the measures, and the absence of key leaders and advocates. For example, except if effective carbon storage solutions are made available, emission reduction objectives are of course associated with reduced revenues from carbon sources, in particular for coal and oil trade. Also, while nuclear energy would contribute to low carbon energy supply, a variety of political and technological barriers and specific risks remain. And so how can we as individuals contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions? As individuals, we can substantially lower our carbon footprint and emissions by changing our lifestyle, diet habits, reducing food waste, and modifying our consumption patterns such as our demand for mobility and modes of transportation, energy use in households, and choosing longer lasting products. Such changes in behavior may improve energy efficiency by up to 20 to 30 percent already in 2030, and in developed countries by up to 50 percent by mid-century. The decisions and actions that are taken now will have a long-lasting impact on the climate. At the political level, or in our daily lives, we can make a difference. <laughs>